You've likely seen celebrities like Christina Applegate, Selma Blair, and Jamie Lynn Sigler publicly talk about their battles with multiple sclerosis or MS lately. But do you know what this disease is? How common is it or how disabling it could be? Welcome to Healthy Living, wellness and prevention, medical innovation, the informed side of care. Welcome to Baptist Health Talk. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Joanna Gomez, for today's discussion. Coming to you from the Baptist Health Newsroom, MS was among the first diseases to be described scientifically nearly 200 years ago. And although doctors back then didn't understand what they saw and recorded, drawings from autopsies clearly show what we recognize as MS today. Here to talk about what living with MS looks like, we have two Baptist Health experts, Director of the Multiple sclerosis and neuroimmunology program at Marcus Neuroscience Institute at Boca Raton Regional Hospital, Dr. Amy Yu, and Dr. Farima Rauf, pharmacy manager at Baptist Health Infusion Care. Thank you to both of you for chatting. I can't wait to, to get into this discussion that really interests so many people and affect so many as well. But before we dive into the conversation, I want to remind those watching right now to go ahead and send in your questions in the comments. Comments. We are here for you and happy to answer any questions that you may have. So let's start with the basics. Dr. Yu, what is MS? Can you just describe it for us? Yeah. So how I like to describe it to my patients is multiple sclerosis. Multiple, it's not a one-time event. People can have a single attack, single demyelinating event, but it's multiple sclerosis is a relapsing, recurring condition. Sclerosis is really just a fancy word for scars. So um, in these uh, inflammatory conditions, there is inflammation that can lead to scarring and tissue injury. Mm -hmm. So it's just, in a nutshell, it's a chronic inflammatory condition of the central nervous system comprising of the optic nerves, the brain, spinal cord, in which the condition causes inflammation and leaves scarring. Okay, so how does it affect someone once they've been diagnosed? So I think the really key point is every person is so individual and it's so heterogeneous. Not one person experiences MS in the same way. Right. Um, they can have different symptoms. Some people have more physical symptoms, weakness, incoordination, dexterity difficulties. Some people have a lot of sensory difficulties, hmm. um, altered sensation, maybe a little bit of pain, imbalance. So everyone is so different. Okay, so when I hear that, I think, what are some of the early signs that people should be looking out for? Is this something that as a child you should be looking for? So not really. MS, although it can occur in children, it is very rare. Okay. Um, definitely if there's a lot of strong family history of autoimmunity and there are clear symptoms, it's reasonable to get examined and evaluated, but it's not very common in kids. Um, really, we're talking about the age of maybe adolescence up until maybe around age 50 is the most common times for MS to manifest. Uh, should we start getting tested for it? How do you even start to even process that? Yeah, so I think for the general population, really, you know, if there's not a family member with MS or other concerns, your risk is 0.1% mm. roughly. So it's really quite uncommon. And even if you're a family member, um, a first degree uh, relative of someone with MS, your risk is maybe elevated at 4% okay. is the current estimate. So it's not even 25 or 50%, but it's a little bit elevated. But certainly if you're of that risk group and you have neurological symptoms, that are um, either transient or unexplained, it's easy enough mm -hmm. to ask for an MRI as a starting point. Okay. Dr. Farima, can people live with MS and not even know that they have it? Absolutely. So some of the most common signs and symptoms of MS, um, including fatigue, dizziness, stiffness, as Dr. Yu mentioned, especially in early stages, are very unspecific and they can overlap with other conditions. So it is possible for individuals to live with MS and not know it until their disease progress to the stages that is clinically diagnosable. Okay. And how is it diagnosed? 
So there are different approaches to diagnosing MS, but there is no one test that can definitely differentiate between MS and um, other tests. We usually start, our clinicians start with blood tests, uh, physical workup of the patient, evaluating their nerve system, following with a specific imaging such as MRIs to have a definite diagnosis for MS. Okay, so you obviously just said, Dr. Yu, the fact that the numbers really go down as if you have someone in your family, the risk generation as it goes by. If you have no one in your family that has MS, then really you shouldn't have anything to worry about. But are there any signs that we're like, well, we should keep an eye on this specifically, even though you have no family history? Well, I think genetics are only part of it. You know, MS, in terms of what causes it, it's a really combination of a genetic predisposition. Family member is part of it, but sometimes Northern European ancestry or certain kind of genetic um, uh, mutations can lead to a risk. And it's that coupled plus with um, environmental risk factors. So some of that can include if you've ever had infectious mononucleosis or EBV infection, if you ever uh, had a worse cigarette smoker, uh, adolescent obesity, low vitamin D. There's a variety of different mm-hmm. environmental factors that can inc- increase one's risk. So I think really the key point is if you have a neurological symptom, it's not quite clear, you know, it's not unreasonable to pursue, to bring that up and at least have it looked at. And what Dr. Ralph was saying is really diagnosis of MS, there's not one thing, but there's a clinical criteria. It's the, currently we're at the 2017 McDonald's criteria. Mm. Really, it comes back down to the idea of multiple sclerosis. The key points are dissemination in space. So for example, on an MRI, you will have different areas, typical areas of the brain or spinal cord that have these changes and dissemination in time. It's not a one-time occurrence. There's evidence that there's been multiple Uh, time points with inflammation or scarring. Okay, so clearly it's not a one size fits all when it comes to MS and probably other diseases as well. But is there anything that we can do, and maybe this question is for both of you, that we can do to just kind of help us to not go down that path, even if you have family history or if you don't? So I think there's a lot of modifiable risk factors. So definitely not smoking, Mm -hmm. living a healthy lifestyle, being at a healthy weight, exercising, um, making sure you're not, you don't have low vitamin D levels. Those are all great things um, to prevent, really. All the good old fashioned things that we know. Anything else though, Dr. Rowe, that you'd like to add to that? I think you're also focused on healthy diet. I think that's yeah. also going to be very important. The lifestyle, the lifestyle, the stress level that we are dealing with in our daily lives, I think that can also be a contributing factor. So what is it like for someone who has MS? What are some of the daily struggles that they deal with? And obviously, granted, we know, like you have said numerous times already, it doesn't look the same for everyone. But physically, what does that feel like? So I think every patient's a little bit different. Some of the, if you look at a population wide with Uh MS patients, the most common symptoms are, can include weakness. So that means uh, maybe there's some foot dragging or hand weakness or leg weakness or physical fatigue. After one mile or 30 minutes, you just feel a little bit not as strong as when you first started. Sensory complaints are very, um, uh, very common, you know, feeling like there's like some, like your arm or foot is wet or uh, tight or swollen when it's not actually. Um, People can have cognitive impairments, so um, a little difficulty with attention um, or difficulty with words. You know what you want to say, but you just can't pull that word out Mm -hmm. in a conversation. Um, People can have bladder and bowel changes, so not being able to hold the urine or having more constipation. Um, There can be sometimes pain, sometimes trigeminal neuralgia, where you can have kind of facial pain. It can be a symptom of MS. Um, And I think other things that is potentially related or associated with MS are also mood disorders. There can be depression that comes along with this as well. Oh, okay. I did not know about that. You You keep saying sensory, and it keeps catching my attention because we hear a lot now people getting dosed with... Uh, diagnosed with sensory issues. Is that correlated? Can there be a correlation to that? So I think there's a lot of different um, reasons why someone can have sensory issues. There's, uh, to give you a little scientific background, there's your central nervous system. Your brain, in the end, is what processes 
and interprets external stimuli as sensations. Right. So you can have a dysfunction in the brain component of how it's interpreting signals. Um, you can also have um, disorders affecting the actual muscle or nerves in the periphery. So peripheral neuropathy, for example, and that is uh, a dis very different disorder where you're having difficulty picking up at the source of sensation as opposed to the other end of it with interpretation. Okay, understood. Dr. Rauf, how's the day-to-day -day management when it comes with someone who is diagnosed with MS and is living with it? Absolutely. So there are several things that uh, we can do to help manage this patient. One of them is symptom management and the other one is maintenance therapy. So currently in the world of infusion, we do see a lot of treatment options to managing this patient and maintaining them and giving them back the quality of life that is expected. When it comes to symptom management, it really depends on what symptoms they are experiencing. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Yu mentioned, there is a variety of symptoms and difficulties that this patient might go through and we will tailor the therapy to the symptoms that they are truly experiencing and they are challenged by. So obviously the disease progresses, correct? Or is it subjective to everyone's diagnosis? I think a good way to understand it is the um, there's different phenotypes or kind of clinical categories mm -hmm. of um, MS. The most common type is what you'll hear is relapsing remitting MS, where you can get one attack, a new symptom, inflammation, and you recover. After maybe about 20 years or so of having relapsing remitting MS, with natural aging, with aging that happens with multiple sclerosis, there can be uh, increased disability or decreased functional ability, mm -hmm. even though your disease is quote unquote well controlled, your MRIs are stable, you're on treatments. And that's a little bit part of the more neurodegenerative um, aspect of multiple sclerosis. There must obviously be a lot of safety concerns also when it comes to someone who has MS. So I think when you're younger, you know, uh, as Dr. Roth is talking about, we have a lot of really good treatment options. They vary in terms of um, degree of efficacy. Mm -hmm. But for example, some of the infusion treatments are mostly high efficacy. And I would actually say, I think sometimes that's a little bit of a misconception about safety concerns. Okay. Of course, there's things that we have to do in terms of blood work to make sure it's safe to pursue one of these treatments. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, a lot of patients with MS are generally otherwise healthy, medically speaking. And most people, if you don't, if you're not one who is prone to getting infections, most people don't even really get much changes, Got even it. if they're on one of these therapies. So now that we're talking about treatments and infusions, what are some of the treatment options that you have? So I, I like to kind of um, break it down to my patients as in uh, in terms of efficacy. So okay. there's your highly effective um, disease modifying therapies. We're talking about efficacy above 80, 90 percent range. Mm -hmm. So they're really, really, really good at preventing new lesions from forming. There's your older, um, you know, and, you know, given context, the first disease modifying therapy was approved in 1994. So they're not that old. Okay. But those are kind of the moderate, moderately effective. So they're still pretty good, probably in the ranges of 40, 50 something percent effective at preventing a new lesion. So I like to kind of break it down as to with that particular patient, how inflammatory are we? Where are where are the distribution of our lesions? How devastating would a new relapse be? Mm -hmm. What are the current symptoms? What style do we want to go down? Right, Dr. Freeman, does these treatments help manage the progression of the disease? Absolutely. So currently we do not have a cure for MS, yeah. but we do have several treatment options that Dr. Yu was referring to. These treatment options are proven and promised to slow down the disease progress and help with managing symptoms and ensuring the quality of life for these individuals. So we have several options. Some of these options are in a form of oral treatment. It's a pill that the patient can take at home. Some of them are injectable and infusion drugs, which a patient needs to go to either to their provider office or an infusion center or through home infusion paths to receive the treatment. I am curious about one thing, you know, right now our society, all we do is talk about living a healthy lifestyle, as we just mentioned, what we eat and what we put in our bodies. You keep saying inflammation. That's another word that just keeps kind of coming at me. And I'm thinking, well, does it matter what we eat? Will this help with the disease? Make it work better instead of making it worse? Or is it not scientifically proven yet because we're not there? 
I think there's a lot of contribution and I think science hasn't fully gotten to that point yet. Um, I will say, you know, I think it is very important and as science investigates more in this realm, I think we'll learn more. Right. I think one really interesting, though, is um, at the most recent Actrams conference um, in West Palm Beach in February of this year, there was a, a research looking specifically kind of at more of these um, uh, compounds that are more related to diet and specifically in fermented foods. Yeah. And it showed, at least in a rat model, you know, that, that this does decrease inflammation and has some benefits. How that translates to humans, we're not rats in a clinical right. research study. You know, well, you know, I think it's interesting, but I don't think we have the data yet. But I Got think it. it's safe. I think it's no harm, low risk, right. and it can only benefit. Why not, right? Uh, you just brought, brought up treatments. Uh, there's a groundbreaking treatment. Uh, it was a neural stimulator. Uh, yeah. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, so that's actually, I think it's actually very interesting. I think what you're referring to is um, the set point device. It's a vagus nerve kind of neuromodulator. Um, it's actually very interesting because, again, at this Actrams conference, this is a separate group that independently was looking at vagus nerve stimulation in rats mm -hmm. and my remyelination. And there were some positive effects from this. So um, it's interesting because I know that Marcus Neuroscience was actually one of the main uh, surgical sites for the set, um, set point trial. Uh, in their rheumatology studies. Mm -hmm. And I think they're now looking at MS studies. And I, I personally am very excited about it. And we're hoping to be one of the sites because I think it's very promising. Yeah, I'm curious to see what comes out of all of this in a couple of years, because now if we have all of this, just imagine what more we're going to have in the future. Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. Okay, so it's time to go ahead and answer some questions that we found. Most research questions that we see on the internet, and I, this was a big one. Can you live a full life with with MS? A hundred percent. You know, I think I have many patients who are surgeons, lawyers, chefs, you name it. You know, I think the key point is getting diagnosed promptly, mm -hmm. starting on a treatment so you can you know, not have further relapses. And I think with those things, look, you're probably still going to have some symptoms. A lot of patients, you know, if you're tired, stress un, um, under the weather, you can re-experience some of those old symptoms again, termed pseudo relapse. But it's not you're not forming a new lesion per se. Um, but by and large, I think a lot of people can live a full life, but that's not everybody. Right. Not one size fits all. Back to that. Dr. Rowe, one of the other questions that we saw was, how can I test myself for a mess, which I think a lot of people are curious about being proactive? Absolutely. So currently we don't have any self-testing yeah. option for the patient to be able to diagnose themselves. Again, we are considering this a disease state that it was a slowly come on and there has some genetic component to it. So um, th there is no actual option as yeah. of right now. So how long does it act? Oh, I'm sorry, you're going to go ahead yeah. and add to that? I will add on to that. You know, I think this is a I think uh, getting an MRI brain is a good starting place. Okay. I'm not advocating for everybody to go and get it, but there is an entity called radiographically isolated syndrome, which means that a patient is clinically asymptomatic. They have no signs or symptoms, mm -hmm. but they get an MRI because of headaches or this or that, and they can we can see evidence of ms and there it, it's, there's a we have to take this with a grain of salt because okay. you want to make sure there's not a misdiagnosis mm -hmm. but if there are findings there that should definitely lead to an evaluation by an ms specialist and might include further testing to see is this just a very very early stage of preclinical ms understood how long does it take for someone with ms and for ms to disable you I think that's a difficult question to answer because I think everyone's so different. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, a lot of patients, maybe it's their first presentation and they have optic neuritis and they lose their vision. They go into the hospital mm -hmm. naturally and they get testing, they get treatments, and a lot of that can recover. Similarly, if you come in and you have weakness with acute therapies in the hospital, you can improve. And a lot of patients with the relapsing form of MS you do improve back to um, back to your baseline or sometimes near your baseline. So there's hope. I think there's a lot of hope. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before I let you guys go, what's the biggest takeaway that you want right now, the viewers and the listeners to take with them? 
I think MS can sometimes be a scary disease. Yeah. Sometimes people think about you know, an aunt or someone, um, uh, a family member from years ago uh, with MS and they think about wheelchairs. I think that's something that I really want to change the narrative because I think we're in a different world now. Like I said, the first disease modifying therapy was approved in 1994. So I, I think the field of MS is so different. And even in the last five years, we have new treatments that we didn't have before. Right. And the um, field of clinical trials looking at new therapeutics is very, very active. So I think there's a lot of hope. You know, seek care. Don't blow off your symptoms. It's mm -hmm. easy enough to do a simple MRI. And if there is anything, then pursue that further. Yeah. Absolutely. And just adding to what Dr. Yu mentioned, when you're diagnosed with MS, it's also really important to keep up with your appointment. Go see your neurologist, see your doctor, seek the guidance, stay on you know top of your treatments, your appointment, whether it's infusion or oral therapy. It is really important to stay within those time frames for the treatment. It is very tempting for the patient to feel better and their symptoms is under you know control and they might get tempted to maybe delay the treatment or skip an infusion. And as we mentioned earlier, these treatments are really there to help prevent the progress of the disease and also help manage your symptoms. So very important to stay compliant with the treatment and of course, doctor appointments. Yeah, ladies, uh, you both were agreeing with each other. So great tips. And, but really, most importantly, thank you for a great conversation that we just had today. And thank you for sharing this insight with our audience. Remember, viewers, be sure to hit that subscribe button that you see right there on our channel here to keep up with the latest health and wellness information and tips from our experts. Thank you so much for watching. Find additional valuable health and wellness information on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news. And be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. Baptist Health Talk is brought to you by Baptist Health, the warmer side of care.